Hello, I am teaching artist Lauren Welch. Welcome to our stream. I am here today with Professor Liu, and today we are going to be going over part three, our curriculum for self-taught artists. But first, if your studio habits need a kick in the butt, Art Prof has everything you need, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. So Clara, can you give us a recap of what we went over in part one and part two and where we're going in part three here? Yeah, so we did part one with Deep D. We did part two with Alex and we covered topics such as art history, contemporary art, sketchbooking. So if you have not watched those, definitely take a look. And we also have this Google Doc which accompanies these three streams so that we can reference what we talk about in the videos easily. We've also added lots of prompts and specifics to the Google Doc. And if you guys want access, the link is in the YouTube video description below. Our approach to these curriculum streams, this is the basics. So it does not matter, illustration, painting, jewelry, whatever it is you wanna study, all of the skills that we're gonna recommend really are applicable to pretty much anything that you want to do. And we will be following up with streams that show curriculums for very specific fields. So we will have one that is self-taught artist curriculum for illustration, for painting. You guys will get all of that later on. First topic we're gonna to talk about today is craftsmanship. So Lauren, what do we mean by craftsmanship? Craftsmanship refers to your technical skills, how perfected your physical object is. So a craftsmanship type skill would be for say book binding, how neat your stitching looks. Do you have any hanging chads or... <laughs> <laughs> or frayed edges or torn paper. Those are signs of bad craftsmanship. It's, it's, you want it all packaged really nicely. Oh, the way glue, the way glue creates those little pockets of air in your, in your book. You don't want any of that. And so if you get to know your materials really well, you will eventually develop good craftsmanship. It's something that takes time. I'm very curious to know in the chat, how many people here have made an artist book or maybe some project that really demanded good craftsmanship and how did it go? Because <laughs> Lauren, I think you told me earlier that you've made an artist book before and how did it go? <laughs> Terrible! <laughs> to be fair, I did not use the art prof video where we have Eloise working on the giant model of the book. I should have used that and I probably would have made a better book. I made mine during class when I was in art school and it was just the worst thing ever. My, my covers were warped. My binding was all screwed up. The book fell apart. Don't have me ever do anything related to 3D. I'm just terrible. <laughs> Well, Lauren, when I started RISD as an undergrad, I had no idea what craftsmanship really was because in high school, I just painted and I did pencil drawings and that type of thing. I never really made an object or something three-dimensional where the craftsmanship, it really can make or break the piece. Oh, yeah. Like if you make a poorly glued together book, it just looks terrible, like so, so bad. And the thing is, you can make a sloppy looking painting and that's okay. I mean, maybe that's your stylistic choice, but generally speaking with artist books, you kind of can't get away with that. I somewhat agree with you. I think that it is easier to screw up with artist books and it's easier to see a bad book, but there are things that that involve craftsmanship in painting that can really make your artwork suffer. One thing that I run into a lot is having my canvases, especially my large canvases, warp. And that's really hard to deal with. And that can make or break whether your painting is in a show or not or sells or not. Uh, another thing is having the paint crack. 
which happens with both acrylic and oil paintings and can be preventable or having something jab into the back of the canvas and then make a dent. Also preventable, but if you don't know your way around materials, it's going to be really obvious and make your work look bad. I also think that a lot of craftsmanship, this sounds really boring, but it's just practice and time and doing it many, many times really badly, actually, yeah. because you know what happened when we filmed this Coptic stitch tutorial? I didn't know how to do the stitch at all. And so I thought to myself, okay, the test of this tutorial is if I can follow it and make a successful book. And I was very intimidated because all the stitching and all that, I was like, oh man, I can't do this. And then I followed the video very precisely. I was like, whoa, it worked. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. But I noticed my first one, the stitching, it was too loose. And so the signatures, which are the packets of paper, they, they sort of went back and forth. Mm -hmm. And as a book, it just wasn't very taut. And then later I made other ones that were much better. So a lot of it is just time and practice, don't you think? Yep. yep. You're talking about tautness there too. And I'm thinking about canvases. That's another craftsmanship thing. How do you make your canvas really, really taut? Also depends on what materials you're using. Canvas is more stretchy and will lose its elasticity over time. Whereas something like linen is easier to keep super, super tight. So also maybe your materials and bookbinding have a similar effect. Some lend themselves better towards good craftsmanship than others. We have a question from Hellish D who says, is it an artist book or an altered book? People have many different definitions of that. My interpretation of being an altered book is a book that already exists that you get from a bookstore. Maybe you cut it up and do all these things to it. An artist book generally is some type of book that you are making either from scratch or maybe you make it from scratch and you add paintings or something else to it. It's a pretty loose definition. Do you have a definition for an artist book, Lauren? I would agree with your definition, Clara. I think an alter book refers to a book that already exists, generally one that is a proper book that then you're turning into an art piece, whereas an artist book is something that you've made from scratch and not like a published kind of thing. Erica is asking, is an artist book cheaper to make compared to buying it? What do you think? That is a hard one. I think just because of the technology and factory type things that are involved with creating a sketchbook, it's probably cheaper to buy a book, but your artist book is going to be unique to you. No one else is going to have it. And people pay good money for unique artist sketchbooks, handmade books. I mean, my favorite part of making an artist sketchbook is that I can pick the paper, I can right. pick the interior, I can pick the size. I mean, it's so cool. And when you get a gift that's an artist book, it's the most beautiful thing. I love it when people give me a handmade sketchbook. Have you ever gotten one? I have. I've gotten a few. And oh, they're so precious. I don't even want to use them. <laughs> one of my favorites actually wasn't even mine. I was so jealous. Eloise, who was another staff member on Art Prof, made a artist book for my partner, Sam, which had these beautiful ducks on it. And it was so lovely and tied up in a golden bow. And it's perfect. And I'm so jealous. I want one. <laughs> We have a comment from Stan who says, I'm still in junior high. I don't have much experience with stuff yet. Well, do you have any suggestions for somebody who maybe is not in college or maybe you don't have access to fancy materials? Is there still a way to practice craftsmanship? Oh, yeah. You need fancy materials. In fact, I feel like most artists, even the ones that go to school, start off on really terrible materials and learn their way around them. It's kind of like when you're a teenager and you get an old junky car to learn how to drive on. Same with artist materials. You don't want to screw up beautiful artist materials. So practice on the old junky ones. Then you'll get to a point where you feel comfortable working your way around those and can graduate to the higher end ones. And then you'll notice that ease of use. You'll be so used to working on that old clunky thing that the new ones will feel beautiful and buttery and smooth and wonderful. And it'll make things so much easier for you. 
And honestly, some of the most impressive projects that I've seen have been made from humble supplies. Like this is a video tutorial we have where people make a sculpture out of chipboard. It's really, it's like a dollar for a gigantic sheet that you can get. And the people that do a really amazing job, you really transform the chipboard. Like by the time they're done with the project, it doesn't look like hideous chipboard anymore. Yeah, Lucia f says craftsmanship will elevate cheaper materials. And I want to add to that, that poor craftsmanship can really downgrade amazing materials. So you're better off having the crappy materials, but having the really good craftsmanship. Because you can elevate. And, and that said, I also think that you don't have, you don't need to have everything to be neat. There are certain circumstances where sometimes a craftsmanship doesn't have to be so impeccable, but it's just the idea that you understand the range of what's possible with materials. Okay, let's talk about the elements of art. So Lauren, can you just explain to people what they are? The elements of art are the aesthetic qualities that make up it <clears throat> make up an art piece, the real fundamental. So I'm talking about color or line or form or value or shape, all these things that are the basic components that make up an art piece that all combined turn into the Mona Lisa or some Renoir painting or the water lilies by Monet. And these are interesting because I don't think these have anything to do with your skill set or background or experience. I think everybody should be revisiting these. Like when Deep D and I did one of these streams, Deep D said she was actually looking at the streams and going, hmm, I think I need a refresher on some yeah. of these concepts. So you don't have to be a super noob to have this stuff be applicable to you. It's stuff that is really easy actually to forget about. Do, do you feel like you ever do that where you're like, duh, texture? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm so glad that we're doing these streams because I, I mean, when we did the one that was on light and shadow, I think it was last week, I, I was totally unprepared. I, I had not touched the basics of light and shadow in forever. And I learned a lot from that stream that I then just, put into my sketchbook over the past few days. I was like, wow, I really needed this. This feels really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for us. So we highly recommend it. And then another thing that I like a lot is that the streams that we have on the elements of art, we give you guys very concrete examples because you know what drives me bats? <laughs> this is actually, this is one of the reasons we started making the elements of arts videos is that the ones that I've seen online are so abstract. They never actually show concrete examples of how texture gets played out, how line is used. And so there are always these abstract ideas that float in your head. And a lot of people know intellectually what line is, but they don't really know how it actually functions in the context of an artwork. So this is not just a way to make that more visible, but it's also a way to translate art history and contemporary art, which is what Alex and I talked about in the last stream. So have yeah. you seen that, Lauren, that like seeing how Pixar used shape, that that can help you understand it better? Oh, definitely. I'm just thinking about the classes that I took when I was a kid, and it always involved drawing eggs. Drawing <laughs> eggs or drawing cubes. And yes, there are eggs and cubes in real life, but that doesn't, I'm not always thinking about eggs. It's much more interesting to think about, as you said, how Pixar takes shape and turns it into a character that we feel something from, or how you can use shapes and cut them out and create your own paintings or drawings with them. You need that, that, that tangible practiced quality in order to make it applicable to the real world. And that's what we try to do is by showing you guys a really broad range. It's sort of like anatomy. Like I did an anatomy stream the other day. I know a lot of people who are practically surgeons when it comes to their knowledge of anatomy, but a lot of them don't draw very well. And I think it's because 
just because you have the knowledge, it doesn't mean you know how to actually put it into practice. And so that's what we try to do here is to make sure we really bridge that gap for all of you. Alex says, do you think someone could be at the same level or better as someone who went to school when it comes to the technical part of art? I'm going to guess you're talking about craftsmanship. So what's your take, Lauren? Oh, yeah, for sure. There are plenty of people that are self-taught that get really, really good at a particular technical skill that are miles better that's, than someone who went to art school. I think the important thing to consider is that there are many, many, many different aspects and skills to art. So maybe someone in art school is learning something different or is really strong in another area, but all of these skills are accessible to you as as an artist learning on your own. And for sure, you can keep up with, say, people that are in school or are practicing pro artists. You just have to put in the time. That's it. It also can be a real mixed bag, depending on what class you're in, what teacher you have. I mean, my husband, when he was a senior at RISD, he was taking some 3D animation class, he had this really flaky teacher who honestly did not know what they were doing. And so my husband being the big nerd he is, he just read the manuals. I mean, who do you know that like actually reads the software and manuals? He read them top to bottom. He learned everything, got to the point where he actually knew more than the teacher and she was not happy about that. Oh, I mean, yeah. she was not very nice about it either. He's sort of rubbing it in her face, but I know really, really mature. But the point is school is not, what makes or breaks you in terms of practice. Ultimately, you're really the person that decides where that is ultimately going to go. The, th the thing is, what school is great at is giving you a structure, a curriculum. And that is what we're trying to provide you guys here right now is your own curriculum. So you can still have that structure, even though you may not be in art school. I want to read this comment from Jason, who says, healthcare professional trying to be a self-taught artist in March to stay sane and grounded. Thanks for the many lessons. Well, that's wonderful, Jason. Keep it up, and we will do everything we can to help you guys out. All right, let's talk about this little subject called color theory. <laughs> <laughs> color is such an exciting thing. It's such a wonderful part of being an artist, but I think for a lot of people, it's a very intimidating subject. I know a lot of high school students just don't do it because they don't really know where to begin or what to do. So do you have any like just general tips, Lauren, for how to get over that? Just, you have to actually use color. I feel, and think about the different ways that you use color, not just, paints or colored pencils or whatever. Think about how you interact with color in your everyday life. That could be your memory of certain types of colors you see in advertising. Like what are the colors that McDonald's uses? What are the colors that Dunkin' Donuts uses? Why do they use those colors? What do you feel when you see those colors? Or what maybe you like to watch What Not to Wear or one of those shows and you like to see how outfits are put together. That's very much also based on color theory and how certain colors balance each other out. So think about it's this transfer transferal or transference of knowledge that you mentioned earlier, Clara, with Pixar and shape. How do we use these colors in practice? And then you can use those colors on your own in drawing or painting or graphic design or whatever medium you work in. It's sort of like what we were talking about the other day in the shadow stream, that if you want to be able to draw shadows well, you have to be able to identify them. Like if you don't know where the shadows are in real life, you're not gonna be able to draw them very well and colors the same way. Like think about movies. So many movies, there's like a very particular color scheme that they pick on purpose. They make everybody wear the same color scheme throughout the whole movie, maybe the sets are the same thing. So I think the thing is you can't have tunnel vision when right. it comes to seeing color, you have to see it in your entire life and walk around and try to really see that. Yeah. Lauren, is there a particular art media that you think is really helpful for learning color or do you think it doesn't matter what media? 
I mean, in a previous stream that we did about creating your own palettes, sometimes I'll use color pickers on Photoshop or use digital apps like that to pick out colors within a composition. I personally look at a lot of photography and a lot of movies for getting good color palettes because they show the way that color is applied to real life, to heighten real life. But you, that's those aren't the only limitations you can go to paintings or drawings or sculptures even or installations to pull color choices michelle is saying it's hard to feel like i can succeed as a self-taught artist when i don't know of any can someone name any well a contemporary person would be the illustrator lisa congdon you guys can look her up she's had a very successful career i believe she's entirely self-taught I mean, this is somebody from history, but Grandma Moses was self-taught. I believe, I can't remember, but we have a top tips for self-taught artists video and we name all sorts of self-taught artists in there. I'm not remembering them all right now, but we definitely have those going on. So yes, it is absolutely possible. Okay, so we do have, just to start, you guys, is this complementary color mixing exercise where you pick a pair of colors that are complementary, like orange and blue. And I actually walk you guys through the entire color chart to understand the subtle shifts of color. So Lauren, I'm so curious what your take is on color charts because I don't know that you've been able to talk about it yet. Oh man, on the one hand, I hate them. And on the other hand, I totally love them. I have a real compulsion to mix beautiful buttery colors and get them exactly in the lines. But what that means is I spend a hundred hours on a color chart, which is really not, I mean, I'll learn how to mix a color, but then I don't know how to apply that color. I've only learned how to mix it. And I have a chart and it looks like everybody else's chart, except maybe a little bit neater and a little bit more <laughs> uniform, kind of like a computer color chart thing. So <laughs> I feel like it's a little bit of a Sisyphusian task almost where I, I do it, but I there's so much more beyond that. It's such a tiny part of color theory. Erica is saying, is it okay to stick with certain colors in your work? I like blue a lot. So I'm familiar with combinations for those, but I feel like I should be more adventurous. What do you think, Lauren? Yeah, be more adventurous. Get get out of those color habits. They will, they, they will, I, I feel like the first thing you want to do is notice, no, look back in your work and notice, pick out if you have any of those color habits, if you gravitate towards one color. Once you've gravitated or once you've figured out where your comfort zone is, pick some opposite colors and do some paintings with opposite colors because that will help you understand how to use your favorite color even better because a color is never just about itself or color combination is never just about itself. Colors do not exist in a vacuum. They're always referring or or in a network of other, other colors that are influencing them. It's a very subjective plastic experience. So if your favorite color is bright, bright yellow, you should be learning how to use grays and neutrals and browns because that's gonna help boost up and nourish your bright, bright, bright yellow. One way that I like to think about color is if you think about every color being a different person and how the dynamics change depending on who's in the room. It's very interesting. Like Lauren, if you and I, say you and I went out to eat at lunch, okay? And let's say one of my RISD students popped by and you didn't know my RISD student and they invited themselves <laughs> to lunch and sit down and you and I are not gonna have the same conversation anymore because a third person has entered our right. lunch. And that's the way color is. Like if I was eating lunch by myself, that's different than if I'm sitting with Lauren. And so that's how you have to think about colors, that they really function as a group. And it's up to you to figure out what are those dynamics that are happening between those colors. Yeah. One other thought, I've seen this a lot in the Discord, actually, you guys. 
you guys are calling each other out because when I see people write things like, I feel like I should be more adventurous. If you guys are asking that, it means yes. <laughs> I had somebody the other day, they said, well, I know that my ideas should be more strong. Do you think they should be? I'm like, well, if you think they should be, then do it. Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's sometimes you do need that extra push from somebody else to say, yep, go ahead. It's nice to have that validation. But my feeling is that if you got a little itch that tells you, eh, I should step outside of this, you probably should. <laughs> I agree. Okay. So this is a complimentary color still life project, which is a really good follow-up to the chart. And I actually have been working on one recently in this water mixable oil paint along. I've only done two sessions on it. But if you guys want to follow along, we have a huge reference photo collection. I think it's better to set up your own, but I did this for the draw along because it's a little bit more convenient. And then there's other stuff regarding color. There's like color saturation. What are bright colors? What are muted colors? And bring it back to art history and contemporary art. Like Lauren, how would you recommend analyzing color? I think the way that you've laid it out here with the bright color, muted colors is a great place to start because oftentimes in painting, at least for me, I am always noticing the brightest color in the room. So I am really pulled into that lime green there. But the reason why that lime green is so intense and so sickly and feels like that fluorescent light is because of those cool grays and blacks that are lining that that composition there. If those were, say, bright red or orange, suddenly you'd have a more tropical feel to this painting, which is totally different. This is a night scene. This is very moody. So literally picking them out like this and labeling, creating a map, kind of like you would a perspective map a little bit, being like, here is where the blue is, here is where the yellow is, here is a neutral color, here is a saturated color. That can help you figure out what's going on. You know, Lauren, when I was in art school, I had this illustration teacher who would get really into, oh, bright and saturation in this compound. And I remember thinking, He's making this up. I think the artist just painted whatever and my professor is just imposing his theory. But the thing is, once you analyze enough paintings and artworks, you realize, oh no, this is not an accident. That it's not. certain things. It's not. There's a, there, we, there is a, I'm going to call it a calculus because it is almost like math. There is a calculus involved in every painting that I do and in every other painting that I've talked with other artists about that is all about trying to figure out a compositional balance through color. You put down one color and then you say, oh, well, that is way too strong there. I need to, I need to balance that in another area and you bring the eye away. And it's this constant shifting back and forth. It's almost like a dance a little bit. And it's very, very thought through. Nicholas is saying, I'd like to know a book to learn a color definition, like the feelings that it could express. Do you have any suggestions for books on color that you think people should look at? Yeah, one of my favorite books of all time is Chromophobia by David Batchelor, which is about how color is used and how white is used. It's a very short book and it's very fun. It's full of pop culture. I highly recommend it. We actually do have a bunch of videos on artist books. So I would recommend looking at those streams because we do talk a lot about that. All right, let's talk about critique. Why is critique a necessary part of being an artist, Lauren? If you didn't have critique, you wouldn't know how to get better. Your improvement would be very slow. I think that there would be some improvement over time, but you need that self-reflection and reflection from others to really see your work, first of all. I feel like when I'm working, I get very blind to what I'm doing after a while. I, I don't even know what I'm making anymore. And other points of view are always going to help you pick out different things that you might not have seen before or different avenues that you can pursue in later artworks. And I think this happens with 
everybody. I do not think it matters how much experience you have, how little experience you have. You know, Lauren, when you're working on a piece and you've been, say, staring at it for two hours, you know, you almost feel like you can't see straight after oh, yeah. a while. Yeah. You know, you just look at it, you're like, I have no idea. And the thing is, then I'll take the artwork and I'll show it to a colleague or somebody else. They go, oh, you need to fix this, this, and this. And I'm like, what? Like, like I could not see those issues clearly the way they could because I'm so stuck in my head that I can't look at anything objectively. I also feel like we need to address the critique aspect of critique, Clara, the, the critical aspect, I guess, because I think that when artists are first getting into critique or are new to the side of one's art practice, their first impression is that they get a comment on something to improve on or just something that another person notices that that is bad. I think in a lot of the critique videos that we've posted, we'll get comments that say, oh, well, that professor just says that this work needs to be perfect and they need to be perfect before they can get into art school. And I really want to stress that that's not what critique is about. It is supposed to be a neutral ground where you're picking out different perspectives from other artists, from other viewers about your work. So you can pick and choose what sounds interesting to you so you can move forward in new ways. It's more about expanding your options. So for example, oftentimes in critique, we'll talk about, hey, have you thought about turning this into a collage? Maybe you should think about working in printmaking. Sometimes it's we're saying, oh, we don't think this works well and here are the reasons why, but you have to take every comment with a grain of salt. Nobody is right. right. I think what's more important is to get multiple opinions and see, okay, is there a consensus starting to happen? Am I hearing similar things from the same people or does everybody have a completely different take? Because if almost everybody that looks at it thinks, well, I know you're trying to draw a lizard, but it really looks like a shrimp. <laughs> Probably we've got to work on it, right? But <laughs> if that's not a common consensus, you're probably okay. Now, Lauren, what do we mean by watch critiques, quote, in action? <laughs> it's it's good to, if you, if you can, drop in on a critique, either with a group of people or one of our video critiques here on Art Prof, and watch how the, the artist and the viewers are interacting with each other and what kinds of comments are being made. There's a different flow to every critique group. There, You'll notice certain ways of talking that are helpful. You'll notice what is a constructive critique versus something that um, Darg is saying here, uh, where saying something like, this is terrible, is, is not super constructive. So you'll, you'll, I think it will help get you more comfortable with critique and get you away from the intimidating qualities of it. It doesn't have to be an intimidating space at all. It can be very safe. Well, I feel that with critique, there's almost two situations that make people really nervous. The first one is something like what Dara said, which is when people are just jerks and they don't say anything helpful. Or the second one is when the critique is just really vague and you're like, I don't understand. Like, what am I supposed to do? That's very frustrating. And so you have to really see a couple of good critiques. Ones where you're like, oh, wow, that really was helpful. And I understand. Until you've really seen several constructive, concrete critiques, you don't truly know what a critique can do for you that is very positive. And so that's why we're saying to you guys, listen, if you don't know where to start, just watch some, see what people are saying, ask yourself, was that helpful? Oh, I like that comment more. This one was not very helpful. That's also really great. Love this comment from Tom who says, giving critique is important as well. Why is that Lauren? Because a lot of people, when they go to art school, they assume, okay, well, when they're talking about my work, I got to listen. But, oh, everybody else, whatever. I can just tune out and think about Hugh Jackman. But, actually, you can't. You have to give critique, too. Why is that helpful to yourself? Well, 
it's first of all it's important as far as being a part of a community goes you that's kind of selfish not to give critique you are learning with the rest of your peers and it is a give and take relationship but as far as your personal self goes it can help you better analyze artwork, both artwork of your peers and artwork in art history. It can help you pick out things that are then useful to you, different techniques. I think it's it's just really good practice in learning how to read artwork or read aesthetics in general in the world beyond art. Shaim says, I'm very skeptical of critiques from people I know, like family members, because they don't have any negative comments and are, quote, too supportive. Or, you know, my sister does, Lauren, she doesn't do that, but she'll look at the work and say, see, why can't you paint flowers more often? I really like this flower painting you did. You should do those more. And I'm going, oh, really? Yeah. I mean... You guys, don't ask your family members for critique. It's not going to go well. Like, I don't know. You, you come from a family of artists, Lauren. Maybe it's different for you. I, I can say that even though I come from a family of artists, we all work in very different mediums, which can sometimes be good. But then other times we just have differing opinions that cannot that do not work together, different values in art. So my dad will do something in collage and reference a piece and I'll, I'll say, oh, that's, that's dumb. I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> or or oh, he'll God. say that this painting is too inaccessible. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a comment from Basil who says, that's why I feel more comfortable getting critique on studies instead of more emotional pieces. When I have emotional pieces, sometimes it feels like a part of me is critiqued. Mm. That's very common. What I suggest is look at our video on how to critique art because we actually have a whole section in that video where we talk about how to handle those more sensitive situations in school and with other artists because it does get dicey sometimes. Okay. Lauren, tell everybody about the critique channels in the Art Prof Discord. Well, our Discord is super cool if you haven't joined yet. I have put my own artwork in the Discord occasionally because the critiques are so good. Everybody really learns how to critique while there. It's very supportive. We have a, a rule or a guideline where if you're posting an artwork, that means that you're also posting critiques on, what is it, three other pieces of artwork in the channel. And these critiques have to be actually thought out critiques. They can't be just, oh, this is good, or I don't like that arm, change it. They have to have some substance to them. But everybody is very kind in helping people develop those skills. You don't have to be like a super pro artist to be able to critique. We have all ages in there. And we also have all mediums. So maybe you're not interested in digital art, but we've got one that's just entirely for illustration. We also have works in progress channels. If you've got an area where you're really stuck on and you need another set of eyes, you can post it in a work in progress channel and people will help you figure figure out where to make your next move. I would like to hear in the chat, how many of you guys have posted work for critique in our discord and what was the experience like? And have you given critique and have you gained from that? Because I think when you learn how to critique other people's work, it makes you see your work more clearly because you start to become very aware of a lot of the concerns that come up very often in critique. Catface Pudding says, I'm a very sensitive and nervous person, so being critiqued might make me cry. Any suggestions? Because I know some people are nervous. Like they're like, oh, well, I know you have these critique channels, but I'm really freaked about posting. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, I think that one thing to ease your mind that we use in discord a lot is the the sandwich the sandwiching method where you give one piece of encouraging 
uh, encouraging feedback and then one improvement feedback and then end in an encouraging feedback. I feel like that's a very gentle way to get into critique. Obviously, not all critiques in the world are like that, but it's certainly a scaffolding for new members that are feeling really in insecure about their work. I think that also <laughs> if, if you are feeling really insecure, it's okay to say that too. You can say, oh, I'm new to this. Be fully transparent. That can also help our our members, the community, Discord community, adjust to your your needs. I think people are very caring and want to make the feedback more useful to you. So we can adjust the level of intensity to what you need. There's two other things I would remember. The first thing is that our Discord is heavily moderated. Okay. Yeah. So if anybody's a jerk we will put them in their place. <laughs> Trust me, we've got amazing mods. So people really will not get away with that in our server. The second thing is I recommend lurking for a little bit. Don't post right away. Like just if you're new to the server, come in, read the comments, see if there's a particular channel or something. And you can always do at moderator and one of the mods will come in and help you. Or I know some people say, well, I don't really know which channel I should post in. I'm doing a collage. Does that count as drawing or painting? I mean, we are here to help you guys out. And honestly, I think when things get hard is when people don't ask for help and then we have no idea that you need help. So ask us, and we'll definitely give you a hint. What about self-critique, Lauren? Because sometimes it feels like, nah, I don't really want to do that right now. I, I just want to look at the work on my own. Are there ways to do that? Yes, there are. One of my favorite ways that you posted up here is to put the artwork away for a while. Sometimes we were talking about feeling really blind to what we're doing, not being able to see it anymore. Sometimes putting it away for a while and then bringing it out the next day or maybe the next week or maybe even the next month can help you see the piece with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective. One, another one of my favorite one steps that you've posted here is to set a goal based on prior artwork. I use that one all the time. So if I notice, and I do this with color a lot, for those of you that are stuck in one color, I found out that I was using alizarin crimson all the time. Alizarin crimson ultramarine blue. I was making my paintings dark. And I didn't actually really like this, but I kept gravitating to those colors. So I specifically told myself, okay, I am not using those colors in my next painting. Or I'll say, oh, I am only going to use neutrals or whites in my next painting. And then I'll try to stick to that. And that helps me gain very specific skills throughout each work. Yeah, I had some watercolor paintings two summers ago, and I was introducing the dark colors way too soon. So the next painting I said, you're not going to do that. You're going to wait way, way longer. And you know what? It turned out better. So it's nice yep. to identify what that is. And I would also say it's nice to have an artist in mind. Like when I was doing these watercolor paintings, I'd been looking at Andrew Wyatt's work a lot, particularly how he uses dry brush techniques. That's really helpful. I know some people write a checklist. Did I think about value? Did I think about composition? Did I address color saturation? Like you can make your own customized checklist of parts of the artwork that are important to you because it is helpful to be able to do this. I mean, ultimately you do want to get feedback from other people, but sometimes you really just need to have that experience. Inji says, I used to be overly sensitive, but I see critique as essential to growth. Hurtful comments are usually more indicative of the speaker. Very true. So true. Yep. If somebody's a jerk to you, they probably are missing something in their lives that they feel they need to inflict that on somebody else. So, yeah. A critique on their attitude. So we have a lot of other critique opportunities here at ArtProf. You can submit to possibly be featured in a live portfolio critique here on our YouTube channel. Some people choose to appear live on video. Other people do not. That's up to you guys. But just go to artprof.org and we have all these buttons that will take you to the submission form. There's no fee to participate. We also have critique opportunities where you submit just one artwork, okay? Portfolio critique is more like eight, 10 artworks. This is just a single artwork. 
And same thing, just go to the critiques page. You guys will find the submission form. This again is also free. And you can also purchase a critique because some people don't want their critique live and public and everything. We also do artist calls. So if you wanna just speak to one of us about professional development or questions or things like that, you guys will find this link in the video description below. This slideshow is also available. The link is in the video description and you guys can use that as a reference, including the doc. And we also have many other videos about being a self-taught artist. But before we go, we want to show you guys this Art Prof Share, which we're very excited about. Art Prof Share is where some of you guys create artwork in reaction to videos or, in this case, our community. So this is by AJ Johnson. They were inspired by our complimentary colors stream. And let me just read a little bit from AJ's statement. I believe AJ is live in the chat right now. And so we have Blue Wolf Spirit, who is one of our wonderful mods in the Discord. So Blue Wolf Spirit, someone said we should have an orange cat spirit since that's the opposite of Blue Wolf. So AJ <laughs> changed their name in Discord to orange cat spirit. And then, quote, one thing led to another. Lauren, can you explain what happened? <laughs> it's just such a good, what's it, adjective, adjective, animal, spirit. It, it's such a good setup. It's great. So we all started changing our usernames to our favorite color and our favorite animal plus spirit. And we all became part of the Blue Wolf Spirit Club. I love AJ's orange cat spirit. Honestly, I would have been fine if we all kept our spirit names, but I think now we're on to, to math, math prof or something in the Discord. <laughs> so so the only problem was that I then started forgetting who, who was who because some get very abstract. I know that Alex was... Naples yellow deer Here he is. yeah <laughs> which I love that's on black paper <laughs> to show the Naples yellow also that deer that is in the upper left has a hilarious face it looks very mischievous <laughs> and then <laughs> mine was mine was red goose spirit and yeah there it is which I also adore especially the one on the right where that goose is yelling and it has teeth it's really perfect <laughs> <laughs> so AJ explains also that they recently bought four new sketchbooks and one was animals. So they took the opportunity to draw animals. And since they like to write stories of all kinds, I know a story made up in my head of all the color animal spirits and how they came to be. AJ says this was so much fun to do a great way to start my animal animal sketchbook. It's awesome. I just, I love this. Like you never know where that inspiration is going to come from. People ask me that all the time. And sometimes it's just a conversation in the Discord that stimulates that. So if you guys want to be considered for an art prof share, just go to tutorials, click on the purple button that will take you to the submission form. Or if you guys want to just show us, you can tag us at art.prof and use hashtag artprofshare. We love sharing these in our Instagram stories. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Lauren and I will be hanging out, speaking of <laughs> the Artprof Discord, we will be hanging out in the post live streams channel and we can continue talking about lizards that were supposed to be shrimp or vice versa. Invite link is in the video description below. Subscribe to the Art Prof YouTube channel so you can continue to grow as an artist. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. You guys are the ones who give us the financial resources we need to keep Art Prof up and running. And speaking of that, stay tuned because tomorrow we have a special four hour long stream. It is our winter raffle. You guys are not going to want to miss this because it's an art prof talent show, right, Lauren? <laughs> yeah, I'm also so lucky to have us doing this tomorrow because I don't know if you guys know, but Jordan and I have the same birthday and Clara always schedules these around our birthday. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so we're spending birthday time doing doing art prof marathon streams where we do crazy stuff like uh, well i can't reveal the talents the the talent show portion it's going to be really fun though <laughs> just note you guys it's a different time we're going to be starting earlier at 8 30 and we're going to stream for four hours and there's going to be there's going to be some juicy stuff for you guys Whoa. to hear about. Yeah, there's so. secret questions. Yes. So. Life questions we're asking. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.